cloud. Being recorded. Welcome, um, ACDA, Towson University student chapter. Today we are doing a veteran teacher panel. I hope you came with all of your questions. We have some great guests with us. I don't know who wants to introduce themselves first, but I'll leave that up to all of you. And you can go around and introduce yourselves and how you know us and yeah, popcorn it. I can go first. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is John Pusateri. I am a 20 year teacher in Baltimore County at Perry Hall High School and um, go Perry Hall District, Terry. And um, we are, um, uh, I've been there for, you know, for the, the entirety of my teaching career. So um, it's been a really interesting um, progression of sort of a change in the, in the um, school um, demographic and um, the makeup, but music has always been at the center of excellence in Perry Hall. And so I've been super fortunate to be um, in that school and also surrounded by amazing other faculty members that I get to work with and um, also other teachers across the district that I get to collaborate with. And I personally know, um, I may miss people that I can just see in the banner, but I personally know Jenna and Liam, um, who are students um, in the ACDA group. And there's Mr. There's Mr. Sobel, and I know him too. And I'm trying to see if anybody else that I am like sort of that I know directly, but it's great to be with all of you guys to talk about what crazy choral directing life is like right now. And also um, the hope for um, what it could be like in the future. So thanks for having me. All right, and we're gonna popcorn it to Professor Icarino. Hi, my name is Terry Icarino. Um, this is my 16th year teaching in Baltimore County. I've been making my way around the 695 corridor. So I started at Red House Run, and then I moved over to the Essex area and I taught at Middlesex. And then I taught six years at Joppa View Elementary. I've left John. I'm at Cromwell Valley Elementary Magnet School now over in Towson. And I'm hoping that's my final spot. <laughs> um, so I- uh, I forgot I'm, that happened, but congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. It's all good. I mean, I'm still going to be like involved in all the things. So it's all good. Um, I, uh, I've been only teaching elementary school, but it's kind of cool to change schools because you really get to see how different Baltimore County is and what it's like to teach a lot of varieties of uh, communities. So yeah, thank you for having me here. Okay, I lost you for a minute. Um, my name is Michelle Barch and I am newly retired teacher after teaching 30 years in St. Mary's County Public Schools, um, chorus. I was Matthews Middle School teacher, so I taught middle school um, the whole time. So um, I did a little bit of the end of the year last year virtually, and um, I um, have not been teaching virtually this year at all. So I do miss it though. Awesome, and our last guest is Mr. Sobel. Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is David Sobel. I have been teaching in Baltimore County for eight years at Hereford High School. Uh, we have a great program at Hereford. Um, I, I've, I've had uh, some great students in the past. Uh, Caitlin Dixon, who's uh, in this meeting right now, is one of them who invited me to come be a part of this meeting. Uh, so thank you, Caitlin, for the invitation. Uh, I've been lucky enough to work uh, with John Pusateri, who just uh, this time last year, um, John John came and clinicked uh, the Hereford Chamber Choir, and we were working together uh, towards the assessment season. So um, it's been an interesting progression in the last year since we last saw each other, John. But uh, thank you all for having me. This is great. Awesome. A round of applause for all these amazing veteran teachers. So I think one way that we can organize this in um, as most orderly fashion is if you have a question, you can use the raise your hand feature and we'll just call on you. Or you could put your question in the chat box and we will, you know, just, it'll be like an open form, like 
one question we can ask to specific teachers or to everyone. So I don't know if anyone wants to get started, but I know we have some Instagram questions. Does everyone know how to use the raise your hand function? So you go down to reactions, it says raise hand. Pretty good, okay. Do you want me to read off the um, the Instagram questions? Sure, and let's get some starter questions in there. Cool. I feel like such a boomer, like every, or um, excuse me, I'm sorry. I, okay. Um, first question. Um, what was the experience like from student to teacher? And the person who asked actually is not here right now currently, I don't think. I was gonna say, what what is that referring to specifically like? Um, that's all it really says here. Um, I'm guessing like, um, you know, frankly, I'm not sure. It's pretty open-ended. I interpreted it as like, um, I interpreted it, sorry, <laughs> as kind of like the transition from like college student into like the real teaching world, um, like entering your career. Okay, so that's what I was thinking you were saying. Of course, it was a long time ago when I was a student, but um, I do remember, it just seems like it's a lot faster. Like you don't realize how much more you have to be prepared when you become a teacher from when you're just soaking it all in as a student. I think that preparation part was the, one of the first things that I thought of as well. And um, in college, they're just giving you a lot of these are the songs, do those songs. Now you have the power to kind of pick what you want to teach, but not just what you want to teach, but why you want to teach it. So really starting to think about um, the repertoire that your students are going to be doing. I think that's one of the most um, tricky things when you're first starting in a school is picking the right kind of songs. I also kind of want to piggyback on that and say, um, you know, we're as teachers, we're going back to the hybrid environment. And one of the charges that I've given my teachers is to start to envision what the classroom will be like, like the high school students haven't come back yet. Um, I know the elementary kids have just this week, but um, I saw and I saw this. Dr. Um, Professor Grunel at the front of her school playing some uke and, and having a great time with her, her, her faculty. Um, but anyway, just to envision what a classroom might be like for you as a teacher when you become that, that you know, when you have that role. Um, and what, what ways, not just from like a repertory perspective, but also from um, a, a social cultural perspective. What ways do you want to influence or expose your students to different types of literature or different cultures based on what you can do, um, especially in choral music. I feel like we have this immensely wonderful tapestry of music to choose from um, that has been really brought to us by a lot of um, composers and arrangers um, and uh, and even like musicologists who have researched where these pieces come from and and their relevance. Um, and we have so many students who will be able to see themselves in the music we choose if we're thinking, what are my students literally gonna be? Who, who, what, will, who what will they look like? Where will, where will they come from? And you know, to envision that and think about that, um, one of the things that I know I didn't do well when I first started teaching was, I basically picked all the repertory that I experienced when I was in high school and college and I thought, oh, my students are gonna have to love this because I loved it. And I think there, I, I mean, it wasn't a total loss, but it certainly wasn't culturally responsive of me. Um, and so if you can take that step now to think about what your classroom will literally look like, it's gonna put you miles ahead in terms of how much you give to your students beyond even just the repertoire. Awesome. So I know we have a couple more like Instagram questions, but 
I have some deep questions for you all. So I don't know if we want to mix it up or anything. Yeah, we can mix it up. And then if, right. if there's if there's a pause in got the it. questions, then I can just read off an Instagram. I got two more. Cool. My deep question, and we're just like diving right into it. What is the most challenging thing that you've experienced as a teacher? Like what event, moment, anything? And how did you work past that? That goes out to all of you. I would, I would say this moment in time has been uniquely challenging in the way that it forces me to think about as a teacher what is important and what is not. Now, there's a lot of models of uh, virtual choir performances and everything else under the sun, and that's great. And, and there's a place for it, and I'm certainly doing some of that. But then I ask myself, what can I continue to do for my students in order for them to continue to learn? At the end of every week, have they learned something new? And are they continuing to grow uh, with their skills as musicians? And in this platform, it's really hard to be able to measure that so your planning and preparation has to reflect that. Uh, and, and I think it has to be more front loaded than what I would normally be doing in the physical classroom. Um, and so with that said though, I think coming out of this, I will be a better teacher for that reason, if that makes sense. Um, I'll piggyback on that one because right now it's just absolutely against all the pedagogy styles that I know of, of we prepare, we prepare, we sing songs for a long time. And now I'm at this today, we're learning so and me, and now we're going to do it 18 different ways in about 15 minutes. Ready? Here we go. And it's just like, I feel like I'm just like throwing it in their face and it's just very different than my actual classroom environment where we would experience the song in lots of different ways and then label it weeks down the road later. So being able to adjust to that. Um, but when you first asked the question, I actually went straight to one of the biggest hurdles that I ever had to encounter was this hearing impaired, dealing with the hearing impaired in a music classroom. I had a child who was hearing impaired, um, vision impaired when I first started teaching. And that was interesting because I thought maybe, well, his hearing and his sense of pitch would be heightened. Not at all. And so um, didn't like singing, didn't like instruments, <laughs> like really didn't like music at all, which I thought was very interesting. So being able to learn how to adapt to that and then how to deal with students who are hearing impaired and their families who are hearing impaired and what kind of resources do the county provide for that was just, it takes a lot of extra effort to get ready for a concert and to get an interpreter and then to meet with the interpreter to interpret your songs correctly. <laughs> so it's just being able to uh, meet the needs of all the students because I mean, I see about 500 of them a year. So I need to figure out all of their little idiosyncrasies to, to include them all. So that's my. Um, and I guess I think I'll add on to that. Um, we get students at times that are um, my former school that didn't speak any English. So then communicating with them, trying to help them um, with the music when they didn't, uh, and you have a regular class and you're well, in my case, in middle school, it's 45 minutes every other day. So you only saw them every other day. You're trying to get everything in. And then you have your students that don't um, are only in music just because they have to go. So you have to deal with all that. I think that's the hardest thing is um, you're excited. You're you want to you think everybody's going to love what you do and then or what you're teaching. And it's and it's not that. And how do you reach all the kids from every level? Because they do also we have special ed students that are in the class, too. So, again, it's trying to reach all of the students, which makes it challenging. And maybe I can kind of encapsulate all these thoughts, especially, you know, pandemic teaching and then um, meeting the needs of all students to say, um, don't discount your, um, your need to have social emotional intelligence as a key factor in your, your abilities as an educator. Um, I, I came into education thinking like, 
my job is just to like let my students explore the vast you know opportunities they have to know what different kinds of music are and and teach them theory and all of that stuff and I learned very quickly that um, meeting them as people was equally as important as meeting them as musicians and there were I had I you know when when you asked that question I several people came to my mind as in as times of success and failure in that um, where I did meet them and and they they weren't necessarily like God's gift to music, but they definitely um, were impacted by it in a personal, on a personal level. And then also people who I missed the boat because I was too, you know, focused on let's make this music amazing. And, um, and I didn't see their need. I remember one specific time we were working on this piece um, by um, Massa, All Flesh is Grass. And, um, and it was a pretty intense rehearsal and a, a student um, she like stepped out right in the middle of it. And I was like totally thrown by this. And um, so I said, can you stay after? Cause we need to talk about why you left. And like insensitive me basically had no idea that she was mourning the loss of a brother who had committed suicide and how this piece was impacting her thinking about finality and eternity was totally what I needed to be sensitive to. And instead I was, thinking about the musical elements of it. And, um, and it really sobered me to, to remember how important that social emotional component is for students. Awesome, those are some great answers. I see Marianne has her, or Rachel, one of them has their hand raised. Yeah, um, I have a question. Um, in school right now, we're mainly like learning DOK and how to like incorporate DOK in the classroom and stuff. But I'm really like concerned if I go to like an upper level music setting that I'm gonna have to like teach theory or like music tech or something. And I'd love to do that, but I just like, I don't know as much about how to teach that kind of stuff. So if you guys are, um, yes, Del Crows or if could I, um, yes, that's what I was talking about, but, um, if you guys are teaching other classes like music tech, theory, um, how did you adjust to that? And was it difficult to start teaching those classes? And if it was, what did you do to help make it easier? I think that I actually am in a unique position to answer that question. Um, John knows my background, um, and, and I'll share this with you because I think this is very relevant. Uh, I am not a vocalist and did not go to school for vocal music. I am a classical guitarist that was hired to teach guitar and music theory. When I signed on to my job, the same day that I signed on, the choral teacher actually decided to move schools. So my principal said, okay, well, you're gonna teach chorus. It's, it's on your resume, you took a couple of classes. This is gonna be your program. And so um, I went in with very little uh, experience. I mean, I sang, you know, in college and in choir and I enjoyed it and I took the uh, methods courses, but not, not in my formal training um, was, I, was I a vocalist. So this is a great example of, of what can happen in um, a school setting is, is you may get a position and be uncomfortable in a certain class setting. Um, and you may find it to be um, great. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, choral music is now my favorite uh, part of my job. And I absolutely am in love with the art form. Uh, you know, I just, uh, Caitlin is a former student of mine. And just the fact that, you know, I can work her through to where she is now, um, coming from a place where that was not my original uh, major. Um, it, it's, it's something that we learn to do as educators is to be flexible and learn to adapt. And it speaks to who we are as musicians and as educators um, to be able to have that flexibility and um, you know, to, to move as a musician into different disciplines. Um, I never expected to be a choir director, uh, even in undergraduate uh, studies, but now I can't imagine doing anything else. And it's my favorite thing in the world. Um, so that's, that's kind of the backstory with that. So if you feel like you're underprepared for a certain class, don't write it off. Just do your best and trust your music, uh, your, your training, 
as a musician and know that that you you can do it. Yeah. Um, as a middle school teacher, I had to teach general music. And so that's kind of the same thing. You just, um, I went back on like a new basics of guitar and piano and, um, and, uh, and percussion. And I just kind of started teaching the kids because they want to touch, you know, instruments. They want to do hands-on stuff and teaching them theory and all that through that. And I actually enjoy having that difference of not just teaching chorus all the time, having, you know, kind of alternating between teaching chorus, teaching general music, and I also taught some special ed support. So yeah, it's just kind of being able to adapt to, and it, you know, you get better at it as you go. And then some days you think this lesson worked great with this one group of students and it doesn't work great with this other class that walks in. So it's really being able to adapt and change uh, um, at any time. And, and you'll find that you may be weak in one area. And so I, I just learned how to play the ukulele a couple of years ago because it was not a thing when I was going through school. So, you know, we're all learning just like you are, and just like the students are. One little thing I want to add to is just, um, I think at that upper level that you're speaking about in terms of where you might get a position, but you might be teaching some things you're not experienced in, um, you know, hopefully you have good leadership above you that can give you um, the support you need to you know, to learn maybe that new course that you haven't taught before, um, to give you, you know, professional development opportunities to help you go see um, other teachers who teach that discipline and get background and information from them. Some of my best experiences in learning how to be a better teacher in my own classroom came from watching colleagues. Um, and so hopefully that, you know, that, that leader, whoever that department chair might be, will give you those opportunities if that ends up being something that you're you're tasked with. I remember I, I had to teach guitar, not to, David does a much better job at being a choir teacher, even though he's a guitarist, as opposed to what I did as a, as a singer who had to teach guitar, because I was literally just one lesson ahead of all the kids <laughs> teaching guitar for a couple of years. Um, but it was a great experience for me as a, as a you know, not, I'm, I'm not a guitarist, I have like four other instruments besides that, that I could play, but that was one that I had to teach. And, and so I just kind of had to dive in and got advice from colleagues who knew what they were doing. And, um, and so I think you will find that support um, for yourself if that ends up being the situation you find yourself in. And to speak on um, behalf of Baltimore County, if any of you are interested in actually teaching in Baltimore County, we have the most supportive music teachers, I think, and we have open classrooms. And I think this digital world of teaching, I hope some of our Googly Meets stay around for that, where I could go visit a class by just being on like a webcam somewhere, because like you can gain so much from that. And I've even found that a lot of the intermediate teachers from or secondary teachers come back to us elementary people they're like how do i do this like they have like a world drumming unit in middle school and they're like i don't know what you're doing and i will give them all my drumming ideas or resources that they might go to um so in elementary school i student taught and i had zero interest in elementary school i was middle school chorus like that's what i'm going to do do or die like i'm not taking any other job well no other job was available so <laughs> elementary happened and my in my student teacher like cooperating teacher said well why didn't you play any games during your whole student internship and i was like what we could play games like i didn't even know that was a possibility because i guess it's just how you make it yours and she was like, well, they didn't need the games because things were fun. So like they were learning, but doing fun things. So I think it's really cool that um, it's, I didn't know that you were a guitarist. So like, that's so cool. I didn't know that, that we all rely on each other no matter what. And that you can even, I can access their materials to grab ideas for elementary school for my GT kids, or that they can join into the elementary curriculum and grab some of our resources to use their way. So it's, it's nice to have a really supportive system that can do that.
Sorry, I have a question. Um, so I guess my question is, what are some of the most useful and engaging tools that you've been able to use um, in the world of Zoom class and Google Meets and online learning? I think you mean Googly Meets, Kelly. It's Googly Meets is the official term. I bet. Um, no, <laughs> that's all I say. I always call them Googly Meets and Googly Forms. Sorry. Just like Schoolology. School no, we go Schoolology is Coolology every time we go in the computer. The parents hate me. <laughs> the stuff that comes out of my mouth isn't for the kids. It's for the grown up that's in the room with them, really. I would say mine is movement. You can tell I can't sit still. Um, so movement has been my key connector and that's where I'm struggling because I am in hybrid world already and I'm like I have to watch them and I have to watch them and they can't die and they can't touch each other and these people need to actually be doing something so it's just wild but um, I think being able to get kids moving and getting away from the screen and using their ears more because I can't assess their singing all the time and now I can't sing in school <laughs> so there's that. So things are really getting tricky. Um, so movement. So right now we're finishing a melody unit, moving to show me Ray Do using hand signs, or I don't even care. We love going off the screen and back on the screen and just any way to get them engaged. I feel like I'm like a reading rainbow episode right now. There's gotta be some TikTok dances in there too. Um, at the high school level, one thing that I'm using a lot that I find, especially, you know, the challenge of engaging students who um, they're behind the dot and they don't turn their camera on. And so you're wondering if they're actually participating is um, a site called Nearpod. I don't know if any of you have used that, but Nearpod is a super interactive tool that you, um, what's great. Okay, so there's other, you know, like whiteboard kind of um, tools and such. But Nearpod is one that um, you, tr you, you literally can track what the kid is doing through the entire lesson. And you can see like, uh, you know, Steve, you haven't turned, you haven't gone to that slide. You haven't finished that line. Um, and, and so you can be super specific with kids and keep them on task. One thing in Baltimore County that I think is kind of silly is, um, we have these wonderful Chromebooks for the elementary level kids and some of the middle school level kids and teachers can track their students' activities um, with this thing called GoGuardian. We don't have that at the high school level because we have these lame HP devices that don't have that kind of um, software on them. And so I have no idea at times what some of the students are doing. If they're even there, I have to kick people out of meets at the ends of classes because they haven't, they walked away and whatever. And so Nearpod is a great tool to keep kids tracking with you and on task during a lesson. Um, if any of you are, have internships in the near, near future, look up some Nearpod lessons. I'm happy to share stuff that I've created with people. Um, another teacher, Megan Yinks, who teaches at um, Chesapeake um, High is amazing with that tool. She also uses Desmos. I don't know if you guys have heard of Desmos before. It's a math tool, but it has great, functionality for the music classroom too. Um, and it's even a little bit more interactive than Nearpod. I've gotten super comfortable with Nearpod, so I haven't moved to Desmos, but um, it's supposedly better than, than Nearpod. So um, anyway, there are some great tools. Of course, most of those are engaging in, you know, more theory-based or skill building type activities with your students, as opposed to virtual rehearsal and stuff like that. And if we want to talk about that, I have some hilarious stories about virtual rehearsing that I'll share. Um, but that was my- Can you, my, that can you my share favorite. one? <laughs> oh my gosh. Please. Um, oh my gosh. Well, I mean, there are so many that just, the, the, the things that come across people's screens when, I, when we're like warming up or working on a, on a piece of music or the things that have happened in my house, <laughs> you know, like my, my seven-year-old comes in and, and like steals the show by singing something from Dear Evan Hansen into the, into the camera while my students are trying to warm up and they're like, why is your daughter there? Liam knows my daughter and, and he knows how crazy she is. Um, but anyway, so th that kind of funny stuff um, 
occurs all the time in, in the virtual rehearsal. And you just get used to it being so much less formal than the normal you know, classroom environment. Um, but the, the most bizarre thing I have to say is you have to like really start to love watching yourself do what you do, right? When you have to teach on camera or, or if, you, if you, you have to at least be able to like swallow the idea that you have to watch yourself on, on this, you know, or, or be just singing to, your cam singing to your computer the whole time. That's super awkward, like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, it's it's an interesting environment for sure. <laughs> Definitely, Jenna. So I had a kid the other day, John. She had it was a kindergartner. She's like, I have soda. <laughs> I was like, this is my life. All right, enjoy your soda. <laughs> Keep it away from your device, please. Oh, like you can't like everything's just unfiltered now it was unfiltered already but it's like magnified now mm -hmm. it's wild yeah and but there are the kids who just are genuinely really too afraid to turn their cameras on um and you got to be sensitive to that too so i've been really trying to strike a balance between holding kids to like i can't help you unless i see you and you and but then there are students who genuinely have issues like I had this I had this one student who had grandma two sisters and their mom on like zoom calls for work all in the same room like that's where she does school and she's like I'm sorry I just like I can't sing that scale for you in the middle of <laughs> of all that chaos I get it I totally get it All right, I see Brandon has a question. Yes, um, I was wondering what it was like managing um, different ensembles like that are, I guess, separate from your traditional classes. Like in my high school, we had our like normal chorale and chamber choir, but then we didn't have men's choir and women's choir as a class. So we like we kind of had to run things on our own. Like I helped run our men's choir my senior year. And it was just like a whole mess because like the teacher wasn't able to help us kind of run that. She just kind of like ushered us long concert time. Um, but like, what is it like managing different ensembles? And like, how do you kind of go about that? I know in the middle school level uh, where I was, like I had my chorus that would um, go to our, um, chorus festival and I had to like beg to get a time during the school day to be able to have the rehearsal because in middle school those kids can't get to and from they can't always stay after um, so you know it's looking at the whole schedule it's getting good rapport with your principals administration and um, and ended up that I ended up doing it yeah during homeroom um, it wasn't very much time and I only I met with each section one day a week, but and then it changed over the years because then they decided to have meetings during homeroom and so then maybe I could only do it two days a week. So, you know, it's just kind of playing around with you got to look at everything and what your school needs Our my school in particular, like I said, didn't have there were a lot of people that just did not had transportation issues. So I either had to do it. I couldn't have after school rehearsals every week because nobody would be there to pick the kids up or I would only have a few kids that could get picked up. So it's basically seeing what the needs are of and from your school and, and the ages too. You know, um, high school, they start driving, they can drive each other. So it's a lot different then. I don't want to steal too much time from the floor, but I would just say from a from a after school ensemble perspective, um, every school is unique in the traditions they have for those types of groups. But then also, um, as Michelle was saying, of what are the needs of the school, and 
um, I think one thing you're going to need to think about as um, you step into a role as the teacher in, in, and you, the director of the program is where do you want to put your energy in, in terms of two things. One, how your program is um, perceived by the community. And then two, um, how you want to mentor students who, you know, just like you, Brandon, who now are, now you are going to be an educator. And so those, that opportunity, even though it might've felt a little bit like you were out on your own, maybe had something to do with your pursuit of music education because you had that experience to lead. Um, so I think about like Jenna had some opportunities to conduct when she was with me at Perry Hall and, um, and even direct um, some of the smaller ensembles that we had because she took a lot of that initiative and showed me that she wanted to do it. And so um, as I watched her develop those skills, I could like sort of stand back and, and even kind of like not even be there at, at points for rehearsals because she was able to then do that, that job. And it, it did enrich the program still because those things got to happen even without me having to be there, which was wonderful. Um, I think that was an ideal situation. Um, but at the same time, if you're stretched too thin, if you're trying to do too many things, the quality of what you do in your, in your, the job you get paid for the, is, is, is something you need to consider. And so um, I, that's just something to think about as you, you know, if you, if you pursue um, a secondary ed job, um, there's a balance that you need to strike personally, but then also with what you want the program to be perceived by the community as, and then how you want to give to your students so they can become more independent as musicians. Thank you. Awesome, so I wrote a question and this is probably for more like middle school and high school teachers, um, but because I don't think high, um, elementary school has adjudication, but um, how did you survive your first year of doing like bring your choir to festival, like your first year teaching or the first year that you did that? And like, did you have guidance who helped you? Like how, just how? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I sought help, you know, basically having a um, veteran teacher come in and help me work with the students and, and help with um, picking out the music. Um, so I wasn't like totally on my own because it is, it's different when uh, I know I hadn't done it for, I went back to teaching music after teaching special ed for a while. So um, it was kind of all new to me. But just going and, and there are most music teachers are more than happy to help all anybody from another school. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is just getting somebody who has done it before and not worrying about that first year. Try to do your best, but you know, at the end of the day, that's about all you can do. And, uh, and then each year tweak it and do a little bit better. I think it's really important in your first year to understand where your adjudicated group was in the previous years leading up to where you are in your first year. Um, I was fortunate where the previous director had recordings of all adjudicated selections, and I could see the programs, and I had access to all of the music. Um, and so I could actually go back five, six years and look at what programs were effective? What is a good opening selection? What's a good closing selection? What are three contrasting pieces that reflect the sound of this particular group? Um, so I, I think it's important for you to do your research and also look back to uh, what, what has been done at, at your school in the past. With that being said, you also have to take really good stock of what you're working with in the fall. When you're, when you're programming in the fall, um, you want to be sure that you're choosing a variety of selections, uh, different levels of repertoire to see where your kids are and how far you can push them. Um, if, if, if a level four is, is, is the max of where you're going to be able to take them, 
then you know that and you have to adjust accordingly for when you're programming to take them to, to festival, choosing level appropriate repertoire. And in addition to that, you wanna also be sure that that also reflects their level of musicianship. A lot of groups can go and sing level five and six music, but then when they go into the sight reading room, uh, they may quickly realize, or you may realize as a new director, that it would have been more appropriate for you to go at a level three or four based on keeping it level between what they can sing and pair it versus what they can actually perform as musicians and where they are as far as their literacy is. So I think those are all uh, major considerations in addition to seeking help. Yeah. I will just throw in there too that um, you know, needing, needing to know yourself and um, your goals, uh, like personally, um, and thinking about the balancing that against what will be a positive and shaping experience for your students is really important. So I made the mistake early on and I had good advice, but I made the mistake early on of pushing and trying to get my students to do higher level literature than um, what they were capable of. And ultimately that made for a less positive experience for them in the process. And I, to me, I, I like the, the experience of assessments, it's a good balanced reminder of that we have goals as performers that we have to maintain. But the idea that you have to like do the best and be the best is really a misnomer in terms of what the students get from it. They need to have the experience of feeling like they've been successful, whether that's at a grade two or a grade six. To me, the grade isn't important. It's about, do they have a musical experience that is successful in all aspects of the performance? You know, all the categories of, of evaluation. And do they, do they get to um, also feel pride in what they've done, regardless of the level? Um, that's such an important aspect of, of it. But, um, but seek out people who you trust, who have experience in it, for that advice on how to, on how to approach the process. And as David said, start early. Like, think about it the first month of school based on what you're seeing from your students and get variety in your repertoire so that you can have, um, you can choose things in the spring that are successful for your students to sing. Awesome, thank you. Um, we'll have Liam go first and then we'll get to Jenna's question in the chat. Um, I, have a, I have a quick question. What does the process look like hiring and working with accompanists? Um, I wonder, is that something, are there like specific accompanists that just work for your county that you can use? Or is that something that you, you have to know people and you have to find them and, and hire them and work with them? Uh, so I can speak to this as um, someone who came into choral music um, as a non-singer and, and not, not as well versed in this art. Um, I had to really uh, do some investigating to find someone who could accompany my choirs because I could not play at all. Now, with that being said, my first year of teaching, I went home and I practiced every day. And now I accompany my choirs in rehearsal every day. And I can do that eight years later. But it was hours of practicing every day. So becoming self-sufficient is an important part of this uh, formula. However, uh, it, it is important that you go out and search for an accompanist, different counties have different um, lists. So um, I, I'm not quite sure, I, I, I believe Baltimore County does. I know they do actually. Uh, Baltimore County has a list of accompanists that are available, but if you're doing something like assessments, you wanna be sure that um, you reach out early and often and the more you build a rapport with someone and repeatedly hire them, the more likely they're to come out and, and work with you again and give you priority. Um, Currently, I, I use a retired uh, Baltimore County teacher, and uh, she is she is unbelievably awesome, and um, and we've built a good rapport over the years. So I, I found my one person. That's kind of who I go to. But you want to build a relationship with an accompanist for sure. We never um, had a list. I think we just it was like word of mouth in our um, district, and you know, and we and you try different ones because some. Some are just better at accompanying. Accompanying is different 
than just playing the uh, playing um, for you. So, uh, and then of course cost too. You have to, you know, how much do they cost? How many times can they rehearse with you? Um, what is their schedule like? You know, so I know my, my company has changed over the years and my last one was a retired teacher that I had a great relationship with who could accompany me on anything. So, um, so it's really just wherever you go, whatever the school district is, um, seek out right at the beginning uh, because yeah, everybody needs an accompanist usually at the same time of year. I just would also add that advocating to have funds to do that, Liam, is something that even maybe in an interview you want to say um, that is important to you. And that will say something hopefully to those hiring you about your expectations for your, the excellence um, in your program. I was modeled, I loved the teacher that I worked with, the, the chair that I worked with growing in, into my role. Um, at Perry Hall, but she insisted on accompanying her choirs herself. And it took me a while to realize that actually there were some positives in that, right? You know the music inside and out and you know exactly what the students are gonna do, but you, you really can't give the students everything they need if you're not conducting without being behind the piano. That's just the bottom line. Um, I, I think a lot of people, maybe in certain styles, maybe in jazz, um, that, that can be a little bit less strict, but in, in, the, in the choral um, performance setting, I just don't see how you can really um, help students emote and help students communicate the music and still be behind the piano. So um, it advocate for that, no matter if, like Liam, I know you have great skills as a pianist, so that wouldn't necessarily be a problem for you, but at the same time, your conducting is that communication skill that's super necessary to, um, to achieve the, the intention of the music. I've been at schools where the principal has a small little budget for a little accompanying as well as sometimes I ask the PTA and sometimes they're just friends <laughs> and baked goods help or returning the favor by helping them in a certain way, like helping them with their program somehow. I don't accompany, so um, that's one thing. Uh, in elementary world, I have, I've been fortunate enough to be at a school where there's some kind of like Clavanova or something that then we, they can record right on because my accompanist normally can't come to the daytime show, which is a school assembly. So. I usually just use that version and I give them the, the credit. And if they can come at night, great. I listen out for parents who say they play and I'm like, ah, I'm like, come in. <laughs> so it's, it's just a lot of that and ask your PTA and what the budget could possibly be. Um, I know it's not the greatest, but I used Finale Allegro all the time and, um, and then just turned it into my accompaniment. Uh, which, you know, some, I mean, it is very regimented because you can't uh, speed things up and, you know, slow things down in concerts and stuff. But, you know, there were times in a pinch when that was my accompanist. Um, when I couldn't have an accompanist, at least I always had that. Plus it always gave the kids uh, an idea of what the accompaniment sound, because I'm not that great of a piano player, what it sounded like before the actual concert. So it wasn't, or before the accompanist came in and, um, and we just kind of got used to that. And it's great when you're going to visit other places too, you basically have your accompanist on a, well now on an iPhone and just take it with you. Thank you so much. Um, I actually have to head out, but thank you so much to all of our guests for coming and giving your time and your answers. It's been really great and great to meet all of you as well. See everyone. Thank you, Liam. Um, yeah, Jenna, do you want to um, ask your question verbally or? Great, yeah. Um, so I have a question. It's kind of long. Are there parts of your music teacher education, like in college, that you wish you had paid more attention to now that you know what teaching entails? And if so, what are they and why? I wish I played the piano. <laughs> I wish I stuck with those lessons. I was a voice major and I had started with some piano lessons because back then you had to take a piano proficiency exam. And um, 
it was, it was hard. It was really tricky. And after I had passed that, I had stopped taking the piano lessons. Cause you know, you have like 8,000 other credits to do. I wish that I had kept it up and I play enough to get by, <laughs> but I wish I could play better. Rachel just told me you took with Dr. Crawford. <laughs> yeah. And I would totally like <laughs> go into lessons and just say, I wanted to work on my improvisation, which was my, <laughs> My I took way of saying with, I didn't practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I took with him like last, like a year ago, which was like when we went to virtual, <laughs> it was, it was real bad. It was real bad. He tried to give me a midterm while he was like on the side of a highway over the phone. I was crazy. Yeah. Anyway, it, it was really funny. <laughs> Anyways, I just He's thought. He's a good man, but yeah. That's a good man. Good man. <laughs> Um, I, I think I'll piggyback also piano. I mean, I, I can play the parts and, um, and now I probably play now that I'm retired, I'm actually playing piano more and probably getting better at it, but there's really just so little time in the day. And, you know, you find you play along with the students, their parts, you sing their parts, um, and you get better at it, but, uh, you know, until you're actually in front of the kids and doing it. And it used, when I started, the pianos were acoustic and they were tall and you had to sit on a um, stool to see over them. Now they're electric, which is great. And you can, but, but then again, too, you have to, uh, what if the electricity went out? I had that one happen uh, last year. And we, or we had to move to a different classroom because of something happening. Well, then you can't take your electric piano really with you. And then you have to figure out what you're gonna do when, or if there is no electricity at the time and the room. So, you know, but piano definitely, the more you can get better at playing even just the parts and then using um, computers, because really uh, to me finale, or, and I know there's other programs that that was a godsend for me. You know, now, now that I think of it, I think one of the things I wish I knew how to do as a new teacher coming into the profession was just the first day logistics, having a handbook, knowing what your concert dates are and how to communicate that with families and what your expectations are for formal wear, costs, expenses, trips, all of these things that you can only really truly know through experiencing them, but how do you backpedal that and administer that on the first day in, uh, in a way that, that demonstrates your command as a teacher? Um, having a great first day lesson plan that shows that you care about your students and you're a competent musician and you're ready to go. Um, think about your first day of teaching in your new job. That, the, the amount of butterflies that I still get for the first day in my first lesson, it's, but it's because it's exciting and because I care. And you will feel the same way. You're going to care a lot. And these are all of the things that we prepare for. We prepare for repertoire and music and, and all of these music-related things. But when it comes down to it, that first week, how are you going to sculpt the entire year through introducing yourself and what your expectations are? And that's very personal, and it takes a lot of introspective thought. And um, yeah, and, and it, it can feel like a lot of pressure. I, I don't mean to like scare anybody, but um, that's that's something that you will get better at. But something I wish that I had thought about when I was in college: what what do I value? What do I want for the future of this program? What's the direction I'm headed in? And then how do you put that on paper and craft it into a, a great first lesson or maybe a first week that demonstrates what you want? Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's what I wish I, I had prepared for in advance. Um, this is probably going to sound a little bit out of left field, but the more I get into my career, the more I wish that I had paid attention to two classes that I know I just like totally blew off as like, oh, whatever, I just have to take this. And so you guys might think this is crazy, but educational psychology and, um, and then like theory, truly theory and practice in education, like 
what are the different learning styles um, and, and models that you can um, employ as an educator, like having a variety in your toolbox of how you deliver instruction is something that is out there. Like there is theory out there and there is information out there that you can be, that, that you can glean. And maybe even from your, um, you know, your, your, um, your supervising teacher as an intern um, that I just kind of, I, I thought this, this is all about music making and that's all I need to worry about. And it is, I mean, it is about music making a majority of the time, but, um, but those understanding students and how they learn um, is something that I didn't give enough stock to when I first started teaching. And it took me a long time to finally, sorry, my dogs are barking. It took me a long time to finally start um, having a better handle on the variety of ways that I need to know how to engage students. Um, so don't slough off those ed psych classes. Awesome. Thank you. So we are running low on time. So if you have any final questions that you would want to get out there, do them now. Um, what is the most useful advice you can give to um, a music education student or aspiring music uh, teacher? Prepare and be ready for what's gonna mess up everything that you prepared for. That's all. And don't sweat it when it doesn't work. And just, you know, if you have a bunch of different things that you could pull in at the last minute or, you know, little things, um, you'd be surprised and then it'll, it'll come together. It'll work out. Um, Jerry Blackstone at Michigan said something that has stuck with me for so long um, in my choral music uh, career. And that is um, well, two things. First notes are best notes. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that. Um, but also just that you really do need to dream what you, what you wanna hear from your, from your students. And it's okay to like have that vision in your head for it um, because if it, that transcends, um, you know, there, there are gonna be all those hurdles that Terry was talking about and, and Michelle said, it's okay that it happens. They're gonna be those things, but to have that view that, um, it, that it, it can be this thing that you dream. Um, keeps it, it has sustained me in a lot of ways because teaching is a marathon. I know that's like such a, a silly pun, but like if you don't come into the profession realizing that on a day-to-day -day basis, you will feel something one day and a totally different thing the next day and then a totally different thing the following day. And you know, you'll, and you will be tired in, in so many ways and, and at so many times. Um, but if you can keep dreaming about what that goal is for you and for your students, um, that will sustain you in that marathon. Sure, before everyone goes, is that okay? I'm just gonna take like a screen cap, is that all right? Okay. Yeah. Smile. All right, everyone smile. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we really enjoyed having you all, you know, at this, you know, event tonight. And um, it's all recorded in case anyone came in late and it will be on our YouTube page. So subscribe. Um, and yeah, I just want to give a thank you to all of you veteran teachers and for all that, you know, you've done for music education and specifically us. So round of applause. Everyone, you know, unmute, say yes, say yeah, woo. Hey, um, I just want to say I put my email in the, I put my email in the chat if anyone has more questions or 
wants advice or anything, feel free to email me. I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to chat further about things. And just make music, love kids and just make music with them. Cause that's really ultimately the end goal, whether or not it's the lesson you plan that day. Do they make music? That's all. Awesome. Well, with that, I'm going to end the um, recording and you are all good to go. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.